Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm Dave Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Uh, a little discombobulated, honestly, Bruce. That was a very discombobulating game for an Oilers fan. Um, a lot. There was a lot that happened in the game. Much of it um, bad. Um, some of it pretty good. I mean, the grade A shots in that game, Bruce, the Oilers lost, of course, 4-3 to the Vancouver Canucks. The grade A shots were 24-10 to 10 for the Edmonton Oilers. And the uh, five alarm, subset of five alarm shots were eight to four. So this game shouldn't have been close. Um, but the Oilers found a way to lose, Bruce. They found a way to lose. And um, uh, in the first period, they got down uh, three to one um, because of that. And it's hard to pull your way back into the game after that, essentially. So it's not like like there's some sc- massive score effects in the grade A shot totals. Yep. So that's were they I, after the first? Well, I don't didn't add them up, but okay. in I can tell you what they were in the first, probably. In, in the first, yeah. Um, one, a lot closer. two, three, four, five, six. Well, how about until it gets to be three to one? Right. At that point, the Oilers have had three grade A shots and um, Vancouver's had four and they've scored on three of them. So at that point, it's the Oilers are behind in grade A shots and the game's three to one. So the score effects are dramatic once the Canucks get that lead. Um, the rest of the way. All right, Bruce. Um This is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast with one conundrum. What's your good thing? Yeah, uh, good thing. Uh, I'm going to go with the, I'm tempted to say, Arthur Silas, who played his ass off for the Canucks, but uh, we'll talk about him, I'm sure. Uh, In the, uh, I'll go with the 3 2 goal, the one Edmonton's first power play unit scored. And really the one uh, goal of the night that Edmonton scored that was, you know, like a pretty play that was, you know, went according to cl- to plan. They got a couple goals on broken plays and they got, uh, they just weren't able to finish otherwise. But on this one, there was, uh, 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 the play coming off at the top of the circle uh, with Ryan Nugent Hopkins in control of the puck. And Zach Hyman was so in Seeloff's face that Seeloff's had to look around on the wrong side, it turned out, mm-hmm. of the uh, screen to see where the puck was. And just as he was looking, Nuge was passing it uh, from c- kind of high in the slot to uh, dry sidle in the dry sidle spot. And Seeloff's didn't even know it was coming, and it was already off of dry sidle stick and caught a piece of the netminder on the way in. But it was. Uh, uh, I just thought a really well executed play and scored because Zach Hyman went to the, you know, the, the uh, uh, dirty areas, as they call them, around the net front and took a lick in tonight, Hyman. He got hit with two or three outside shots and uh, uh, took a couple of whacks from Vancouver's uh, rugged defense group. And. Uh, uh, but he hung in there, there, no point, but a, a goal was scored. And um, uh, I thought, uh, you know, he was at least as much to do with that goal as the two guys that, you know, made the key play with the puck. Leon Dreisaitl was, I thought, amazing in this game. You know, he just um, he just kept coming and coming in this game, you know, j- just no stopping him. And I thought at the start of the game, actually, um, that he was, didn't look right. Like he looked worse to me at the start of the game than he looked in the previous game, he looked to be skating more stiffly. Mm-hmm. And, um, but in the end, Bruce, he led the team. He was, a, he was, he was involved. He made major contributions to 10 grade A shots. Oh. Didn't Leon Dreisaitl. Mm-hmm. Just one great play after another with the puck. He looks kind of like he did when he was injured now in the last playoffs, 2022, when he had the um, high ankle sprain. 
Um, and, uh, but was just incredible when he had the puck on his stick and he's, he is right now. And you know, it's funny, Bruce, I was talking to my wife, like, as I get older, I'm, I'm a bit less of a fan myself, like a less ego involved, the team less riding the highs and the lows. But I have to say it's, I find it painful to watch this team lose because of players like Dreisaitl and McDavid and knowing how much they want to win and care about winning and are desperate to win. That's what gets me is that this team has these incredible hockey players and they're, and, and I'm not writing them off in this series, but that was a really, that was a really tough loss. And it's just tough to see them get beat in a game like this, where they're just playing their hearts out. And Leon Dreisaitl was certainly doing that all game long. My good thing, Bruce, is Evan Bouchard. And um, in the last couple games, he is just, what did he get? Like 31 and a half minutes of ice time yes. this game? Yes. He's, he is just, he is a monster out there right now. He is playing such fantastic hockey, moving the puck, moving the puck, moving the puck, making moves, shooting the puck. And, you know, he was rewarded late in the game with a, um, with a group with a goal, another goal, like the overtime goal that went in off a uh, Canucks player. You keep hammering Ian away. Cole, though. Same guy. <laughs> you keep hammering away. And you're going to hit Ian Cole sooner or later. Yeah. It's going to so, bounce into their net. He's they their should... Carnell nurse. Eh? Like hmm. he's that yeah, guy. Like it. He's that guy on the Canucks. Deflected but Bouchard's in. composure, Bruce, is, is it's so impressive. And I know that a lot of people, um, they, um, they don't like his calm. Like or his what they would what they they would describe his calm as a lackadaisical attitude, mm -hmm. but I'm just gonna I don't think it's that at all. And I think um Rick Talk had hit on this. He was after the um the uh, Canucks uh, lost to Edmonton in the last game. Talk had gave um in his press conference. He talked about what went wrong with the Canucks, and he was just totally upfront about what happened. And and he talked about this was a team that instead of making plays with the puck um, was flipping, tr flipping it out and turning it over, flipping it out, turning it over, flipping it out and turn turning it over. So um, here's what uh, talk had said about that. So, quote, too many guys were flipping pucks when they didn't have to. That's the only thing I didn't like about our, our team in the third period. That's when Mc McDavid scored to tie the game. I guess that's playoff experience. You have the puck, you have somebody on your back, skate with it. Keep your heart rate down. I just felt as soon as somebody got it, they flipped it, like everybody. I think there was plays to be made. We didn't give them anything to defend. And that's what happens. He means the water's tying the game. And when he talked about the heart rate being low, and he, and he mentioned how Sidney Crosby always talked about this. Um, he says, Sid Crosby was the best at this. We used to talk about it. When somebody is on your back, your heartbeat should never be 200. It should be the same because you have possession. Just skate with it. And I just thought of Evan Bouchard. He is his his heart. He is just the calmest guy, and you, you see it now um, with him executing fantastic plays under pressure constantly. He is calm. He's moving his feet. Someone's on his back. He's skating with the puck and he's making a play. He is a fantastic hockey player, and I I I've said this earlier. I've I've argued that I think he's the Oilers' best defenseman this year. And I know there's a, there's an interesting conversation to be had between him and Ekholm. And I, and I, I understand that most people would probably favor Ekholm and which is fair enough. I don't have a quibble with that, but I think he's their best defenseman because he creates so much on the attack. And right now, at least Bruce, he's not giving up much on defense either. He is playing really smart, solid defensive hockey. And I mean, <clears throat> when bad things are happening in this series, is it Evan Bouchard on the ice? Not that much, not that much. So he's my guy tonight. Good choice. <clears throat> he had an excellent game. And he's, uh, <coughs> he had uh, 14 shot attempts, six on goal. He had a goal and assist and even, which this is in a game where the Oilers were, um, they didn't score any five on five goals in this game, right? They got two on the power play and one on six on five. Yeah, and they just couldn't generate any goals five on five. They came close a whole bunch of times. They sure did. And we'll <laughs> get into that right away. Bruce, what's your? We'll go with two bad things each, since it was a um, 
wretched game. What's your bad thing? Yeah, I'm going to go first with the uh, three to one goal late in the first period where they they scored early. Uh, Oilers did, but they didn't have a good period at all, really, in the first. And ultimately, it cost them a hockey game. And this one play very late in the first that turned it from 2-1 deficit to a 3-1 deficit was massive. And this was a play where they actually survived a Vancouver um, attack on net, and they recovered the puck, and Warren Fogle <coughs> had, had the puck deep in his own territory with all of his teammates, including both defensemen, tearing out of the zone, expecting a rush to go the other way. And he lobs this backhand pass to nobody, right into the middle of his own slot. Just a weak uh, fanned attempt that just went right into the slot and it went to uh, 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 Pia Suter. There was only one assist on this goal because it went to a Vancouver player who immediately passed it to the guy who scored, that being Brock Besser, who was behind... Um, Fogel and the defenseman because those guys all sort of left the left the territory uh, anticipating well, they were something moving up that ice, right? just yeah. didn't happen. Yeah, we're going to yeah. all move up ice and I'm from the school where the defenseman, one defenseman keeps his spot until you've established that you're actually moving up ice. Anyway, the, the big mistake by far on this one was Fogel's. And you could say CC allowed a pass on the subsequent play and not be wrong, but I would say CC had very little time to respond to. The puck going north with orders in full control to suddenly coming right into his own low slot. And of course, Brock Besser, uh, he didn't miss, and he didn't miss much in this game. And uh, uh, Vancouver, when they did get their shots, they made their shots. And he made this yeah. one. Yeah. Um, I didn't like Skinner, Stu Skinner on that goal against, I just felt like he was too deep. Like he's got it. Like there's no pass there. Besser's the only person around. Right. Come on out, man. Like be aggressive, make the play. And he just didn't. And he was down on his butterfly and, and early. way back in his net early. Mm -hmm. So you give him Brock Besser time to pick a spot, like even a, a fraction, he's yeah. going to hit it. He's a fantastic shooter. Yeah. He had to come out there. Fogel's the look on Fogel's face though on the bench afterwards. Again, I, I felt it's it's terrible. Like you know, well, mistakes happen, and he made one. You know, you just, he, I feel he bad. Suffered for, for it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I feel bad for the guy. God, he was he was so downcast. I agree with you on CC. We you know we we marked him for a mistake. We might want to take get rid of that. I'm I'd be open to that because it when you watch it again, when I watched it again, um. What what bothered me initially was both CC and Nurse went right for the puck as soon as yeah. it happens, and instead of someone thinking, well, there's Brock Besser behind us still. Why doesn't one of us? But it's pretty hard to organize yourself after an ugly turnover. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible. In fact, only the very best defensemen do it. Like Nicholas Lidstrom would would have done that. He would have he would have thought instantly where the danger is, and he would have went to it. I think that's not CC or Nurse. They're not thinking the game at his level right and, and not many. And to be fair, right? Like I'm not, no, not many do not many do. It's just the rarest defenseman. Actually. I think he would have made that who would have backed off on that play or like you say, play it more conservatively fr from the get go and realize someone's behind you and just kind of stayed with them until the pucks out of your own zone kind of thing. But modern hockey is, you know, they want all five people to players to join the rush so there, there's that too you know to, to be in to keep the team moving up in tight mm -hmm. formation up so there's that too it's a different game always than it was even when nicholas lidstrom played the tactics change so there needs to be a rush in order to join it though indeed bruce you know <laughs> and when your guy that f first has the puck gives it away to the other team that rush generally tends not to work out too well and it didn't what a terrible play by fogel yeah. bruce um, the orders do find, you know, they find ways to lose games. They mm -hmm. almost found a way to lose the last game with Skinner's um, mistake on that goal over his shoulder at a key moment. And in this game, um, they they found a way, they definitely found a way to lose this game. As well as they played, getting down three to one, mm -hmm. 
That didn't happen by accident. It happened by error. And two of their best players, actually their best player, made an error, I'm going to suggest, on the second goal against. The puck's in the Edmonton end. It's in the corner. And the Vancouver player has it. And inexplicably, almost, two Oilers go at him. And I think Ekholm was playing him a little um, soft because he he realizes there's no real danger from this player in the corner and he just wants to cover off the pass. But it's Ekholm's man and Ekholm, I think, has him, giving him some cushion. And I think that was probably the right play. But McDavid reacts to that by charging, puck, you know, puck watching, but charging at the player. So it's a two-on-one and he leaves. Instead of looking for the danger man in the slot, instead of covering off the slot where they're going to score the goal from, instead of sound, fundamental defense. Mm -hmm. He overreacts to the play. He is like an off, like offensive players do. He's drawn to the puck to try to win it. And it's the wrong instinct. And you have to check that. And he didn't. And because of that, there was a wide open shot. Brock Besser's allowed to move right in and fire home a goal because of Connor McDavid's mistake. Yeah. And so it's a that was a really rough error because it was one one at that point. It's anybody's getting now you're behind. You you had got up one nothing. It's all going your way. And then there's a then there's a, uh, you know the the penalty kill lets in a goal. That's a tough play. But this was just a mental error, and it's mental errors on defense, Bruce, that kill the Edmonton Oilers again and again and again. It killed them against Vegas last year. And here was another one. And then there was Fogel. There's another one. And now it's three to one. And now, now you're down two to one in the series. If there's any team that can come back, of course, it's the Oilers. But it's asking a lot. It's asking a lot. It's yeah. asking too much. Well, we've seen it a lot. We've seen the yeah. Oilers come back repeatedly in the last few years where they get down two goals. Like, we've seen that a ton. Right. I, I don't have a statistic right now to back that up. Like, are they the best team at coming back in the NHL? I, don't, I can't say. But they do it, they do it a lot. Well, tonight they fell behind by two goals, and then they outshot Vancouver 36-7 in the last two periods. And that doesn't count the three or four shots they had in the last minute of the first when they did everything but score, hit a post, got another puck behind Seelovs. You know, like the, it's like they flipped the switch then, but they flipped it too late, and they couldn't solve the other goalie, and they couldn't get a save. And they, you know, it was... It was... Um, but those early mistakes, you know, last game there was a play. I noticed you know, on rewatching the game, there was a play where Besser was loose in the slot. And who's the Oiler about six or eight feet away from him? McDavid. Except for McDavid looks around with his head on the swivel, identifies the danger man, gets over to him just in the nick of pass to break up a potential dangerous shot from the slot because he was doing the head on the swivel and take the man, not don't get glued on the puck. And tonight he made that fundamental mistake of getting sucked out of position. He's generally speaking, a solid defensive player. Um, he's, and and he has been, like they're all working at it. I can see Drysaddle and him and all of these offensive players. They're really working at their defensive games and trying to conscientiously cover the right people in the, in the zone. But sometimes old, old habits kick in. So he, that's what happened on the play. And um, he's an aggressive player and he acted in an aggressive manner and instead of a safe manner and bang, two to one. What's your second bad thing, Bruce? Yeah, well, I'm going to go with a 4-2 goal on the power play. Uh, and I mean, we can start with the uh, absolutely feeble cross-checking penalty that led to that power play on a night that cross-checking seemed to be several different things, but never the same thing for any length of time. Uh, <clears throat> the penalty on Nurse was... Uh, uh, like, I don't know what the hell they th thought they saw that he did. He was battling for the puck. Anyway, fact remains, I got a power play out of that, and the orders needed to penalty kill, and they couldn't get it. And the play in question, the puck came into the slot to uh, Elias Lindholm and he was kicked the puck up from his skate up to his backhand side and he just shoveled one that went through 
uh, Stu Skinner and caught the post and went in on the way in. And it just was one where uh, he needed to be stuffed and he wasn't. And yeah. it just stood out in stark contrast to play after play after play at the other end where Arthur Seeloffs battled every last inch. He pulled one puck off the goal line. He saved another one from going to the net by grabbing the stick of his opponent. Got away with it, which is, you know, great play by him. And yet when Vancouver, like, was this the only time in the game that they got in, like, real tight to the net? Like, I can't remember stuffed plays getting stuffed. This one went through, and it turned out to be the game-winning goal. When and Skinner so is mad at the refs, but you need a friggin' save once in a while, and they're just not getting them from Stu Skinner, who's now in this series, uh, fifty-eight shots, twelve goals against, on fifty-eight shots, a seven ninety-three save percentage. You are not going to beat the little sisters of the poor with a seven ninety-three save percentage. And I'm just seeing them, uh, like, you can say, well, he didn't have any chance on the Besser goals, and you're probably not wrong. And at the same time, I'm just not seeing aggressive, challenging, uh, you know, God, when there's the shooter has one option, which is to shoot the goalie, maybe should cut down the angle a little bit rather than being already down on his knees on the goal line. And I'm just not... Uh, yeah, that wasn't happened. a good... He is a good goalie, good. but he's been rotten in this series. And, you know, he, this is a bad time of year to not be playing somewhere close to your best. And Yeah, he got pulled after that, of course. So no, And no surprise, no surprise. Not really, yeah. Pickard came in and played the third period. And, I mean, I don't know what to say about Pickard because Vancouver had about two shots on him, right? They had one really good shot. One through... Um, yeah, that's one through a screen and then the rebound, the guy shot it wide, but it was that was the closest they came. Yeah. The only other time they got close, they got in on, on well, I think Beck, Besser's um, goal off the Fogel turnover, he was in pretty tight there um, mm -hmm. on the goalie. But those were the only two times they're in tight on him and getting oh, shots. Right. Yeah, and that got through too, didn't it? And that got through too. So he, yeah, he just in tight, he, he, was, he was back in his crease, conservative. Mm -hmm and cautious and you know that's not that's not a way to play goalie i don't think like that doesn't generally work out too well you got to be confident and um challenging the shooters a bit more than that it stood out in pretty marked contrast to what the guy at the other end was doing indeed bruce um my second bad things are this is the breaks of the game and it seemed like the oilers got a number of bad breaks now of course you make your own breaks to to some extent well, in see. hockey and uh, it is a saying and there's some truth to it and we saw it in the first shift where two different people knocked matthias ekholm off his feet that was a bad augury Start. foreshadowing for the rest of the game wasn't it and um yes. first lindholm and then dakota, dakota joshua they both clean hits and they knocked the yep. big guy right off his feet in the in the uh, first shift of the game and that was kind of like whoa and mm -hmm. the Canucks just kept coming and coming and coming until they're up three to one. And then the Oilers pick it up, but the breaks don't come for the Oilers. They start to get grade A shot after grade A shot. And uh, so I'm going to focus on two, two breaks that ha that happened there. And you've, you've mentioned them briefly, but the first one is this, this uh, scramble around the net with like uh, 40 seconds left in the um, first period. And first, Connor Brown makes a great pass to Vincent DeHarney in the slot. And DeHarney gets off a slot shot um, right in close. And of course, he didn't score. <laughs> but then the, the rebound, somehow Ryan can't hit that rebound shot. It's right there behind the goalie, behind C-Loves. He's behind him. And it's just his body angle is wrong at the wrong moment. And he can't get that first clean shot in the net. It should be in the net. And then it's 3-2. Last minute of the first period, you score to make it 3-2. You are probably going to win that game with the momentum you have. Or you right. could well, right? Like, it's huge. That is a huge moment bad. in a game. That was where um, Seelovs grabbed his stick, by the way. Yeah, that's what I'm He was that's... able to shovel it towards the yeah. net, but Quinn Hughes came through and cleaned it out. Ryan keeps fighting away, and then Seelovs gra grabs his stick, and there's no call. 
I can, you know, I can understand. But it's it is a fast game. He's lots is happening. Lots is happening in that moment. It's chaos in that moment and around the crease. So I could see why they might not have even seen C Loves do it. They maybe just thought he got his stick pride in there rather than C Loves grabbing it. So that that failure of the refs in that moment, I just thought, okay, that happens. That's hockey. McDavid got away with one against Quinn Hughes. Like this is a really big moment, and he might have scored um, there. Uh, he was sh- sure jamming hard, to, and he might have scored, but such is life. Then there's another moment. Again, the owners are pressing hard, and this is um, three minutes into the second period, and um, Ryan McLeod uh, makes a pass, and Perry gets a nice shot and almost scores. And I don't think it was actually in. I, I know Knobloch said after the game that he thought it was in. I didn't think that puck was in the net. I think that was the correct call. But again, it was just oh it was just a matter of <laughs> centimeters. The difference between that being a goal and not. It was on and the goal line. Great it's play by C. To, to get it, but yeah. you just they just couldn't seemingly get a break. And then if then they then you know their great power play goes to work. And they make make it 3-2. And we have a game again. Like, this is a game. And the orders are coming on. They get the next four even-strength shots, Bruce, after that goal. And, and uh, the first one's by Nurse off a Holloway pass. And the next one's by Fogel. So so a couple of them aren't even their big guns. And then, of course, a couple of them are... Dreisaitl comes in and hits the post on a great break-in play. Again, like, they just three times now. They have had unbelievable chances to score. And they have not been able to score. And then drive subtle comes in again, and there's another great shot. Um, I can't actually remember which of the whether it was the first or the second that hit the post, um, but he, twice he breaks in, and there's absolutely great scoring chances, and he and he's unable to drain it. And then there's the nurse penalty, which is, you know, there was a a play in the first period. They they showed a highlight, or maybe it was just during the play, but Milner was just going to work on. JT Miller on Leandre Settles back with cross checks. And I, <coughs> and again, <coughs> excuse me, I'm thinking, well, that's the standard in this game, I guess. You can cross check people. And um, three or four times. That period. Three, three or four times, right in the back. Oh. And then Nurse is involved in a puck battle, and he just uses his stick as a wedge. There's not really much of a cross check at all. It's more of a wedge play where he's just pushing the guy with his stick rather than cross checking him. And he gets called on a penalty for that after what JT Miller did, like bam, bam, bam. Mm-hmm. That was that was a little that was very very frustrating, Bruce. That that call against Darnell Nurse. And I'm going to read you. Um, if you just think this is a disgruntled Oilers fan saying this, it's not. All four commentators on Sportsnet uh, after the period said the same thing. Kevin Bieksa said the call was awful. Luke. Gazdick says, I don't like the call. I'm with you on that, says Ron McLean, who generally stands up for the refs. And I agree with you, says Elliot Friedman, who again is a nonpartisan neutral observer, as you'll find. And they all four of them agreed. You know, Beck Bex, the most colorful, states it most clearly. This was an awful call. And and it was made all the worse because Vancouver scored on the, the game winning goal. Yeah. I yeah, so. on the power play. Now, great teams, you know, they find a way to win. And so this is the challenge for the Oilers. They didn't get a break, and it really hurt them, and they didn't find a way to win. But this series isn't over, so we'll we'll see what happens. The, the next break I want to talk about is, um, well, they almost scored with one second left, but another great <sighs> So, so again, it's an outside shot that hits the hits. I think it hits the boards and comes back. And um, and I was it Hyman at the side of the net and almost put it. Was McDavid? I was McDavid. And um, then the final bad break is there's a horrendous uh, attack on Connor McDavid. Frankly, now he's he's involved in some mucking. He's he takes a hack at someone in their sh- you know lower body hack with his swing of his stick at the shin pads, that or the pants that never hurts anybody. Like that's mm-hmm. not that's not a nasty play. So what happens then? Zadorov comes and cross checks him in the back, and he goes down. And at the same time, Susie cross checks him right in the face. Now apparently, I, 
there is minor penalties to, to one minor penalty to Susie. Penalty. Bruce, Cross checking. This is, I this is a vicious them. assault at the end of regulation time over. Um, at the end of a game, intent to injure plays by two Vancouver Canucks defenders. Just by their actions, I'm saying it's intent to injure. You cross-check someone hard right in the Zidorov middle of the back. was vicious. Susie was ill. I mean, McDavid got, because he got cross-checked right into Susie. I, I don't know how culpable Susie was, but it's his stick sure seemed to catch McDavid in the face. Yeah. But hey, it's only Connor McDavid and it was only Leon Drysaddle and, and it's bad back getting worked over by JT Miller. Why would the refs want to call that? It wasn't obvious or anything. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> David, I got to say, the officiating in this series has been wretched in all three games and fans of both teams have had every reason to be livid at them at various times. Yeah. And, you know, it's just NHL officiating, man. So they couldn't get a break this game, Bruce, and um, and uh, they lost. Such is life. I guess the Bouchard goal is a break, but it's almost too little, too late. Like you know, there's some hope in that moment, like faint hope. You know, that after that, that they're going to get another one with a minute left, and and um, but not to be. And uh, I just just when the game was on the line, when they needed a break, they couldn't get one. And that was really frustrating. Yeah, or a save. Save would have been nice. A save yeah. would have been. There was one nice. good save that I can remember when the Oilers, the one power play that went sideways, and uh, there was some kind of breakdown, and and uh, this O man who came in for uh, Vancouver tonight got a real nice shot from the slot that Skinner pulled down. Would have been a killer goal at that particular moment, but uh, it uh, there just haven't been enough of those. Yeah, Bruce, uh, as you, I'm gonna get. We're gonna get to your number. I gotta go get my battery charger because my computer's gonna die here if I don't get it. Oh, so okay. you want You keep talking, and it's, I'll be about thirty seconds. What's your number? Okay, my number is twenty nine minutes and forty two seconds which is the ice time for Connor McDavid in this game. And we can extend that to include 29 minutes and four seconds for Leon Dreisaitl. And everybody in Edmonton's big top five played 26 plus minutes. Ekholm was the, uh, uh, Ekholm and, uh, I'm sorry, Ekholm played 24, Hyman played 26, Bouchard played 31. And, the Oilers are playing every other day for the rest of the series. And now this is two games in a row that they put a huge workload on uh, McDavid. Like, I thought, frankly, that he was flagging uh, down the stretch of this game, that he sort of reached his his uh, energy limit. And I didn't think there was a lot of juice in the tank in the last five minutes. He did c come close to, to potting one right at the end there, but... Uh, uh, he had given it a lot, but the 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 um, usage of um, of him for like ha literally half the game tonight is going to make Game Four all that much tougher. And then, you know, this is after playing 28 minutes in the last game, dry saddle 27. So you got these two stars that each have played almost 60 minutes in the last sort of 50 hours. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, uh, that's an alarming number. I mean, the other night you could say, well, it worked because they won, but now they've won one and lost one, and they've got sort of their their five main guys are are. Uh, uh, running a little closer to empty than they were. So, I don't know if you were able to hear any of that, David. <laughs> you probably heard me banging away. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I didn't curse. Uh -huh. uh, is it charging? I don't even know if it's... Yeah, it is charging. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. Yeah. Thanks for filling out. Had me on speaker. Anyway, I was just talking about McDavid's ice time, dry saddles ice time, and all the big five uh, and 
two games in a row now playing almost 30 minutes in each of them and they're going to keep playing every other night there's no time to you know it's not like they have three or four days off and now when they can rest up for a bit it's right back to the the grinder and did you, you mention how, how little time thing out there did you mention how little time some of the because that'll be my number oh. if you didn't brace oh okay no no you go right ahead with that one and there's lots of choices there too Listen, Derek Ryan is playing well in this series. He almost scored a big goal. He played 733. Yeah. Janmark, 618. Um, oh. Connor Brown, 802. Give that line another shift every period. Yeah. How about that for a thought? Because they're playing well. That's actually a line that's working. Mm-hmm. And, um, they, you know, they're, they've had some good shifts at the, you know, throughout the series. Um so yeah, I Holloway eleven twenty five, McLeod eleven oh six. They're not McLeod is a such an odd player. Like he's got one grade A shot the entire playoffs, and um, I know there's like a, a lot of people really think he's a fantastic player, a- and he is a good he he can be a good player, but he he hasn't been effective. So like I but I do think they need to find a line with uh, for McLeod, and I don't think it's I. I'm still mystified at Corey Perry. I know he had the one chance tonight, but man, he's not effective. He's too slow. And I just think they need to put McLeod with Holloway and, and Fogel. I've been saying this for some time now to get some speed going. They didn't, those guys didn't play much. Corey Perry played 945. That's how much he should be playing. But um, yeah, that fourth yeah. line, play them more. They're a good line. They had five forwards with under 10 minutes tonight. Five. It's not like just the fourth line. It's like the whole bottom six was uh, not getting much time. Yeah. Not good. Bruce, let's move on to our conundrum. And it's the obvious one. Who's going to start next game? Um, I've done a Cult of Hockey poll, or I put a poll up on my Twitter account. And um, I'll post this online if you want to vote in it um, at the Cult of Hockey sure, uh, and the, and uh, all readers as well. And so so it's interesting. It's like almost exactly uh, one third say Skinner should start the next game and two thirds say Pickard. 33.6 for Skinner, 66.4% oh. for Pickard. Oh. Bruce, to me, I'll be shocked if they go with Stuart Skinner. And this is the second year in a row we've had this debate. And last year I was stick with Skinner, stick with Skinner. That was my my point of view because I was never confident in Jack Campbell. Even when he played well in the playoffs, he didn't look good. Uh, To me, he always looked shaky. Like he was lucky, I thought, in in those games that he played well, which might be unkind, but that's how I saw it. Um, But Skinner has not, this entire series, he has not, he has yet to have a good game. Um, the first game, every goal that was scored against him was like, maybe if he had just done, like, they were all good shots, as I recall that Mm -hmm. first game, but it was like, eh, just couldn't you make a save on one or two more of them? Cause, cause they're grade A shots, but you've got to stop, you know, in the NHL, you've got to stop at least three out of four grade A shots. Like you just, you know, that's the, that's the key. And if you're letting in, as he did, four out of nine grade A shots tonight, it's not nearly good enough. In the, and in, this, in the second game, there was the goal over his shoulder, which was a back-breaking moment late in the second period for the team. Amazing comeback after that, but almost didn't happen. It took Conor McDavid's heroics to make that happen, come back and a win. They cannot, they, they I just... I will be gobsmacked if they go with Stuart Skinner. I see them. Calvin Pickard played well in the regular season. He showed he can come in and win games for this team. The team, I think they've lost. They look tight to me in some ways with Skinner and that. Like, I just don't, I mean, that's, I'm just, that's, I, I, I can't, like, I can't read anybody's mind. So I don't actually, you know, I don't know what they're thinking about <laughs> having Stu Skinner net, but I can't believe that they have, here's what I was say. I can't believe they haven't lost confidence in Stu Skinner as a team and that they don't want it. The, the team wants a change. That would be my guess. And maybe I'm completely wrong, completely offside, but I just, it'll be Pickard. I think what's your take? 
You know, they're kind of between a rock and a hard place now, aren't they? I think Pickard's a good option. Yeah, uh, he's yeah, he's he's um, you know, a, a, a veteran journeyman goalie that's finally made it back to the NHL after several years of mostly being in the minors, and he passed most of the tests. He had a couple of couple of iffy outings, one in Ottawa that comes to mind where it was kind of like this game where the Oilers outshot him like sixty to eight and they lost, right? And it was uh, one of those kind of games, but uh, uh, far more often he came in and you know was sort of reasonably solid. And they need a minimum; they need reasonably solid, and they haven't been getting that, I don't think. And I'm a fan of Stu Skinner, and I'm but I'm. I can't lie. I'm disappointed with this play in this in this series. It's sure reminiscent of last year's series in the second round against Vegas. It really is. And all those critics are just filling their boots, and it's pretty hard to have much of a rejoinder just based on the results. Yeah, I think last year there was still a lot of support for Skinner, mainly because a lot of people I don't were like me. They didn't trust Campbell necessarily. So there was, but I don't see, I, I don't know, I haven't been online, I'm not, I, but well, we see 33% say go with Skinner. I think if we did a poll last year, I don't think it would have been that low. I don't, I can't recall if we did one or not at any point, but I think it would have been at least 50% say stick with Skinner. There was, that was a, a, a common theme from uh, Oilers fans, but Pickard's played well this year. And um, here's what coach Chris Knobloch said. He, he, he said, do you need you need more saves from your goalie and Knobloch said yes we need more saves tonight obviously I felt like that with pick picks going in in the third period picks is pickered but yeah defensive and along with goaltending it's very important to winning hockey games especially in the long term and it's got to be better he then was asked um how what did you think of Skinner's play I think tonight he said I think tonight is one he'd like to have back we'll see what he's got all night yeah the whole night We'll see what he's got in the future, whether that is game four or game five or whatever it is. We'll be seeing Stu again, and no doubt that he'll respond and play well. And then they asked him when he was going to make his decision. He's made his decision yet, and he says he's not committing to anything. It's you know it's emotional right after the game, and they'll talk about it tomorrow. Do you, who do you think they're going to go with, Bruce? Who would you, first of all, who would you go with, and who do you think they'll go with? Well, last year I thought, they actually should have gone with Jack Campbell in game six against okay. Vegas after Skinner got blown from the nets in games three and game five. And they kept saying, well, he always bounces back after a bad game. And I'm going, well, I need to win two in a row now. So they don't just need one bounce back game. And Campbell kept coming in and, you know, making saves and keeping them in. There were some score effects because usually when he came in, they were down by a couple of goals and the other team, you know, was sitting back and kind of doing what Vancouver did tonight. Uh, and I saw some people online suggesting Campbell be the starter in game four based on his play over the the uh, fullness of the season. Uh, and I guess they're not trusters of Calvin Pickard. I think the, you know, the hierarchy says Pickard has to get a chance. And it may come in the next game, but boy, this is, you know, you sure don't want to lose that game, do you? Okay, if who would he you wins pick? It, if he wins it, he plays the game after that. Why would they go back to Skinner at that point? They they won't. So who would you so pick, I, I think it's going to be Pickard. And who would you pick? <sighs> yeah. Uh, probably Pickard. Okay. No, it's not, okay. not an ideal situation, David. you got a number, you know, a the true what they've been treating as a number one and the number one is you know develop some cracks and their it's backup not, is you know it's not like he's a 1a pickard's been a, you know a true backup throughout yeah it's not ideal to go with your third string goalie either but it's worked out for vancouver you know who knows right like yeah, we, we sure just don't is. know we do not know what's going to happen if they go with pickard i just think they will because they they need to see they this this I think the team needs a boost and a change, honestly. I don't think they need a vote of confidence in Stu right now. It's not what they'll be looking for. Like they 
dramatically outshot the other team. Skinner hasn't played well at all three games in a row. What was his save percentage in this series? You just 793. said 793. 793. 12 goals on 58 shots. Ruth, it kills you to have that goalie in your net. It kills a team to have that goalie. And they're they are being killed by this right now. And they're all feeling it. They can't, they're not, and they won't go back to Stu Skinner, and they shouldn't. So I'm a bit more, in fact, I like your approach, though. I mean, I'm not criticizing you, uh, your your more tempered approach. I appreciate it. But I'm... Distempered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I just, I just, I would like to see Calvin Pickard. We'll see what happens. Like, you got to roll the dice sometimes, and it's not working. Three games in a row. You know, the owners arguably could be up 3 nothing in this series easily. And um, they're not. So Sorry. they were lucky to win the last game. Man, they shut it down so tight in the third period in the last game. Skinner didn't no. have hardly anything to do. And in the overtime, like, yeah, they're, they're in need of a change. And I think they're going to get one. So we'll see what happens. Interested in your your take on one other play in this game, David, and that was the one where uh, uh, Nikita Zadorov rode Evander Kane right up and over and into the Edmonton bench, and he kept pushing and pushing, and and Kane was scrambling to get out, and uh, his skate came up at one point, and they wound up calling a two-minute penalty on Zadorov, and they also called a two-minute penalty let's get this right it was a bench miner they thought someone grabbed someone they grabbed a bench a bench miner for oh i thought they called it uh roughing but it just says here a team got a bench miner i thought yeah the bench got a roughing penalty and i'm thinking that's pretty amazing for a bench to take take a you know an action like that it's it's a weird it's a weird play bruce right yeah, it's a weird play. It was so it's an unusual play, and it really it like because I'm an Oiler fan, it really bothered me. Although if it was Kane doing that to Zadorov in the Canucks bench, I would have loved it. So it was one of those plays that I think partisan emotions are going to get the best of um, observers. Um, Kevin Bieksa was saying he thought it was enough. Like there shouldn't have been, they, he thought both, both calls were silly. I didn't like it for one reason. I thought Zadorov was holding. He, he essentially yeah, he didn't hit, hit this player. And then he, he just, he was lifting, pushing, trying to get him to go into the bench. I don't think that's what bothered me is the holding aspect of it. Um, I just, I, I thought there should have been a penalty to Z- Z- Zadorov and not to the orders on the play, but I, I, I'll take the X's, uh, you know, although he's kind of a partisan too, isn't he? Because he's a, he's a Canucks alumni, as he calls himself. Mm. But, he, you know, he did say that the call on nurse was a, was an awful call. Um, so I, I just. Yeah, even a Canucks alumnus could see that was a. Even a Canucks. Call. Yeah. So I thought it was a holding call on Zadorov because he was actually holding him down, pushing him and holding him into the bench. And you're not allowed to hold players. He, 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 no. You can hit them, but you can't hold them. You can't do that. So, anyway, what did you think? Well, I just thought it was another physical play where Vancouver kind of got the better of it. And it happened too much in this game that they outshot, out hit Edmonton 50 to 30. And you can say, well, that's because Edmonton had to puck a lot. And that's true. But 50 to 30, starting in the first 14 seconds when Ekholm got pounded twice in a row in the very first play of the game and i wasn't totally thrilled that evanton had enough pushback yeah, I, I agree vancouver was the more aggressive team right from the opening seconds to after the last second when the two of them viciously cross-checked mcdavid and i'm sure vancouver fans are thrilled you know kane got it mcdavid got it dry saddle got it ekholm got it. all these bad guys that were such goons in game two getting what's coming to them i'm sure it's like you're here out of vancouver but as an edmonton fan i just didn't see enough hey you're going to mess around with guys like that we're going to mess around with you or your guys or whatever 
Yeah, much Kane. Messing yeah. around. Like Kane, he had four hits in this game, but I, I didn't, you know. And who'd Nurse hit? Like, who'd Ackholm hit? Who'd, who'd the Oilers, the Harney, who'd he hit? Yeah, there was no big hits from the Oilers. Uh, I the Harney remember. hit nobody. He had zero hits. Uh, Nurse had three. And uh, Ekholm had one. And Vancouver had five guys with five or more, and Edmonton had nobody. At that and I, level. One other change I'd be thinking of making is putting Philip Broberg in for Cody Cece. I know it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen any more than Jack Campbell's going to get in the game, which is why he's, they're not in my poll like Jack Campbell. I didn't include. Like These are these are things that are not going to happen, even if people are speculating on, on them. So I'm speculating on Broberg. I, I would like that to happen. I think he's he, his speed and agility and playmaking ability, and he's a is a good a defender at CC as this point would make a difference for the Oilers, and they could use his mobility to help uh, both on offense and defense, but it's not going to happen. But that's my two cents on that matter. Alrighty, Bruce, what night is the next game? Every, every even number date for the foreseeable. This is. Uh, uh, Tuesday will be next, then Thursday, and then Saturday. When I was a kid and I watched the Stanley Cup playoffs, I always watched the third game closely because it seemed whoever won the third game won the series when I was a kid. And I don't know if, if statistically what, you know, if it's more important than the, the first, second, third, or fourth games. You know, they're all, but I just, it always seemed if you could win that third game, you're going to win the series. And um, well, Vancouver sure. played well tonight. They deserved, you know what, they deserved the win. That's that's the bottom line. This was the most deserving of the wins. Like they had the win in the first game. They they deserve this one and they got it. Well, if forty five to eighteen outshot is deserving to win, and I mean they did things they score needed effects. to do to yeah. win the game and it was score right. effects. Yeah. And it was closer than any of those statistics show. Uh and they executed when they got their chances, they executed and they got a lead and they held the lead. Post or uh you know, couldn't solve the goal. Yeah, that's right. And goalie is part of hockey. So oh, yeah, big, big, big part. That is right, as we just found out tonight. Bruce, let's leave it there. Thank you for talking tonight. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.